adequacy identification information of common substances, um, the ability to uh, access CAS registry numbers that were linked to authoritative chemical information and their identifiers, um, the access to associated data in common machine processable formats and an API with a well-defined data structure. And I'm really happy to share that we were able to achieve these goals through the relaunch of CS Common Chemistry. So CS Common Chemistry has a web-based user interface with API access. Uh, it includes now nearly 500,000 chemical substances with their CS registry numbers and chemical structures provided in a variety of formats, including MoFile, Inchi, Inchi Key, and Smiles. And it includes a consistent JSON schema for that API-based access for more programmatic use cases. So now I'll walk through a few details of the resource as well as some particular successes of this project. So what you're seeing on the screen now is a screenshot from the main CAS Common Chemistry homepage. You'll see we've got a, a search box as well as the ability to gain access to the same content via the API. The resource now covers, as I mentioned, uh, nearly 500,000 substances and is provided under a Creative Commons license. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. On the detail page for a substance, uh, you can see the CAS registry number as well as several representations of the chemical structure, including the mole file that can be downloaded. Uh, the CAS name and synonyms are also included as well as some basic properties. And every page offers a pre-formatted citation to help students and researcher, researchers cite this resource effectively. The Common Chemistry API offers the same information in a structured JSON format. Uh, this program, the programmatic access is, is available to support a variety of batch-oriented use cases for searching and analyzing chemical information, as well as for teaching and learning of chem informatics. The nearly 500,000 substances that were selected for inclusion in CAS Common Chemistry were really chosen in collaboration with the community group that first proposed this to CAS. We focused especially on chemicals of concern, so those that appear on global regulatory lists, as well as substances that are relevant in academic and teaching use cases. So we pulled out, for example, several homologous series and other compounds that often show up in early undergraduate chemistry classes. In designing this solution, we started with a prototype built by Stuart. Um, as you can see on the screen, this prototype was absolutely phenomenal in communicating the needs and design elements of the solution that were most important to the community that we were working with. And as you can see here, we almost exactly replicated the prototype in our ultimate design of the solution. So thank you again, Stuart. The selection of the license was another really key win for this collaboration. The original Common Chemistry resource launched back in 2009 didn't really have very clear license and it certainly wasn't open, um, even though it was openly accessible. And we knew that this needed to be updated. Uh, so the original draft for the relaunched Common Chemistry resource uh, included a license that was open, but it was written in custom language that wasn't generally understood or used elsewhere. So through the collaborative work of the community group, we were able to highlight the fact that using a Creative Commons license would offer essentially the same terms, but in a clearer, more reusable and more readily understandable way for other open projects. And so the resource, uh, the CS Common Chemistry resource was ultimately launched under a CC by NC 4.0 license. Um, and we're, we're very happy with that. So uh, the, on behalf of all of CAS, I just want to share that we're really excited at the success of this project and the collaboration that led to it. And I really hope that you will use the resource and help us to spread the word to others who might be interested. Um, thank you very much for the time. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is here on the slide and I can also post it in the chat if you'd like to get involved or, or help us as we continue to evolve the resource and uh, our support for those who are using it. Thank you, Andrea, um, for that overview and nice piece of time too. Now, Andrea, I know you're not going to be able to necessarily last the whole 90 minutes, so we'll happily take a couple of minutes now just in case anybody has any questions they want to direct to Andrea. I guess one might be, do you have plans for how it might be evolve and develop into the future? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Ian. Um, we have a working list and we're actively trying to consider what, what might be the best next steps there. Um, we are uh, working on drafting a publication to further raise the awareness of this work. And um, you know, more, more to come in the next couple of years, I think one particular focus area is really that development of lesson plans and use cases for the existing resource. So we're working on a presentation for next year's ACS meeting that will cover some of that information. Okay. Thank you. Um, if anyone does have any comments, questions, or oh, someone wanting to come in there? Just a question. Um, um, yeah. I would like to know about the API. I mean, uh, we can, if we want to have information and so on, we contact you. Is yeah, so there's- you, you are the contact person. Uh, so there, there's information directly available on the website for how to access the mm -hmm. API. But if you um, have feedback or, or questions, I'm happy to field those. You can also contact our you know, general CAS help email, help at cas.org. Okay, thank you. I managed to actually register for API access the other day. It seems straightforward, but I haven't actually tried using it yet. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, okay, um, we'll move on. If other questions, comments um, crop up, feel free to use the chat. Um, next, we have Christoph, who's going to talk to us about what's been going on in Germany and NFDI for Chem. Thanks, uh, Ian. So I hope people can A, hear me and B, see my slides. Um, the update that I would like to give is about um, the German national research data for uh, initiative or infrastructure for chemistry of which I'm the speaker. Uh, a quick word on the on the background. Um, a couple of years ago, the uh, German federal government and the states decided to create a national research data infrastructure. The German word is Nationale Forschungsdaten Infrastruktur and uh, the uh, acronym for that reason is NFDI. And um, this is really exciting for us because they decided to pump in uh, substantial amounts of money for a long time. 10 years is the initial horizon. Uh, there is a, a nice contract between the states and the, uh, and the government that things will be extended afterwards. So there will be continuous funding. Um, it's not just chemistry. It's um, there was the decision to fund 30 consortia over all areas of science. Um, and um, the, these 30 consortia will be reached in three rounds of, um, of funding uh, decisions. And we now had the second round, so 10 consortia, uh, 20 consortia are, are being decided already. The uh, chemistry consortium, NFDI for Chem, is uh, a large a collection of um, institutions all across Germany dealing with uh, research data infrastructure. Uh, we started our work um, precisely a year ago. And um, I mean, we all know the, um, the, the state of research data management in at least in academia, in, in chemistry, it's, um, yeah, I like, I, I think it's a disaster, <laughs> but, um, uh, certainly, there is a lot of things to do, and um, most people in, our, in in the academic labs in Germany and I guess elsewhere are sitting there with their with their handwritten paper notebooks, and um, data is coming in from NMR instruments and other instruments, and they are somehow managed by the PhD student or the postdoc, but there is no no decent integrated management, and NFDI for Chem wants to change that. Um, and our, our vision is that we you know, want to um, provide an infrastructure, a, con a concrete uh, electronic infrastructure where people can um, manage fair data at the earliest time point in the lab using electronic lab notebooks and then using open data, open standards, uh, open source software, uh, share this data in public repositories with the community. And of course, that's the, the big part getting the community involved and really um, make them use the, the data. Um, it's a complicated um, a plan that we are following or complex uh, or rich, whatever you would like to call it. And as I mentioned, the key part is um, kept, capturing data in electronic and well annotated form as early as possible in the lab. Uh, and that's through LIMP systems, uh, electronic lab notebooks, and from there data should flow into public repositories. 
um, where they are shared with the scientific community and, and that's all supported by uh, uh, standards, uh, terminologies and um, of course a lot of software development. This is not going to happen uh, just within in Germany, obviously, um, the, the infrastructure that we are building is open um, to the international community. And most importantly, a lot of standards development needs to be done, including the question of minimum information standards, uh, where we have to decide for lots of areas in chemistry, what people actually should deposit as the minimum set of metadata for their research data for the data to become useful. And that happens within the context of um, the international bodies that are interested in standards, including, of course, the RDA and the Chemistry Research Data Interest Group, but also the whole academic community worldwide, because we all need to agree on and publish those minimum information standards and, and, and other standards that are required to make the, the vision of common um, data sharing in academic chemistry a reality. The key use cases are clear. We need to um, start equipping academic lab workers with ELNs so that they can really capture the data, not on paper anymore, um, and then make sure that with one click of a button at the point of publication, data gets um, transferred into the domain-specific repositories, it could be as granular as uh, an NMR spec uh, repository or an, a, a mass spectrometry repository, or just general chemistry. And there, in order to make that vision happen, there are a lot, as I mentioned, a lot of standards missing, which we need to develop with the worldwide community. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to jump quickly over the next things. We, we worked for one year, we established a help desk, um, we opened up a terminology service to make sure that um, if, if a chemist want, wants to know how to call a certain thing, he can find it or he or she can find it. And um, there is a knowledge base on all the services that NFDI for Chem is going to uh, provide. You know, but this is all basically, um, this could be just documentation of vaporware. Um, so there is there are also the key components already in place. Um, we have a very good uh, open source electronic lab notebook called Chemotion, which is in the center of our efforts to give those ELNs to researchers. And Chemotion also has a, a, a repository in the background, um, which is free and open to the academic community. So if you have a data set in chemistry, you can um, A, manage it in, in the ELN called Chemotion, and you can submit it to a public repository uh, hosted at the KIT and funded by NFDI for Chem. And in addition, um, there will be more generic and more specific repositories uh, for domain specific data in chemistry that are currently developed. And I would like to finish with the questions that uh, Ian sent around. And I, I wonder, should we address them now or should we address them later in the joint discussion? I think if we hold on to those for the joint discussion, I think that would be best for now. So okay. thank you very much. Uh, in this case, I'm I'm done with my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you for that overview. And and yeah, I think you know each time I hear that this talk about it, it's kind of yeah, it's certainly an impressive ambition and the approach that you're taking, you know, certainly looks to me to be the one that is gonna if it, you know gonna most achieve success. Um, and I think it recognised that needs for standards as well to kind of pull things together. Um, any quick questions for Christoph before we move on at this point? Uh, if not, Abel. When you, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, it's just uh, when you do a deposit of data, do you get a, a identifier for your data set and then you can cite that on the paper or something like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the, the, there is there are stable identifiers associated data sets and of course um, DOIs for every data item uh, so, which you could cite. And is it um, open to any researcher in Europe or is, is it just uh, uh, German yes. specific? No, you could definitely 
um, you know, any any researcher worldwide could deposit data in uh, NFDI for chem repositories. Mm. There was also a question in the chat. Um, oh, so, sorry, Abraham, did you have another question? No, no, that's okay. That's, okay. that's okay. Yep, do you want to take the one in the chat about um, vocabularies, ontologies? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's an, an interesting uh, uh, key question. Obviously, there, there are so many subdomains in chemistry um, which need to get active or realize the fact that they start to need to start developing uh, ontologies and vocabularies. And one of the missions that we've uh, set ourselves is to, in some of the key areas uh, that we identified, uh, which we determined by the size of the divisions of the German Chemical Society, uh, we are going to drive those developments of MI standards and vocabularies and ontologies. But obviously, we can only do so much. Um, there will be lots of uh, orchid um, areas in, in chemistry, which um, probably need to get their own act together. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll move on in the interest of time. Um, Abraham, I think you're next. Uh, in fact, I know you're next. <laughs> Um, so moving from Germany to the UK now and the first of a couple of talks about activities that are going on over there. So Abraham, over to you to talk to us about Catalysis Hub. Yes, hi. Okay, yeah, we have a um, lot of activities from the last, since the last uh, RDA meeting. So the, we are just talking about these activities. This is the motivating scenario. So. If we think uh, we get a, an interesting publication, so we like the results, we like the, 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 the shape of it, can we look at the data and try to replicate the results? Or can we look at the methods, get the software and apply it in somewhere else? So these are two parts of this. Uh, uh, well, it's using data and, and using the uh, resources. So the first thing we develop or we are developing is the data manage, uh, the catalysis data infrastructure. We have published in this uh, URL, you can see it if, if you want to, to review uh, contents. And we are linking publications, data sets, um, institutions, authors, and we try to make this, uh, uh, the looking up for resources easier. Uh, and especially in, in this case, uh, data sets. So on the one hand, uh, tracking publications and authors and citations is very interesting, especially for funding institutions, for our partners, for our review board, but we all also want to pull up these uh, data sets. So in terms of data sets, we can uh, already see some results. Uh, and this coincides with the, the data that has been published by other researchers, like saying most of the data that we publish is supplementary information in the form of unstructured data. So that's documents like PDF documents, Word documents, presentations, and, uh, but, we, we, if you can see by the numbers, we, st we are starting to see higher number of data sets. And in data sets, we are including raw data, um, uh, crystallography data, Excel spreadsheets, which have some, some, some kind of structure and so on. But, and we, uh, also coinciding with this, we can see that the major uh, repositories at the moment are uh, publishing houses. So because uh, this, this, they, they are the ones uh, where this um, supplementary information is deposited um, apart from other institutional repositories. So the, the only two uh, specialized uh, data, data sites uh, would be uh, uh, Cambridge Crystallography Data Center and ISIS. So those, those are the ones that I, I can see on the top 10 of the 442 data objects that we have indexed uh, thus, this far. 
So we 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 would like to get a gold standard for fair data. So the article, uh, this example, uh, this article, it's is is like what we would aspire everything to be like. Pro, uh, it includes all data, process data, uh, um, models, uh, raw data, intermediate data. It's openly available. It's in, uh, uh, it has identifiers and it's easy to reach. So it, 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 it ticks all the boxes of the fair uh, data principle. So that this, this for us, uh, this would be like the gold standard and we would like to bring all the, all the publications that, uh, that are produced to this uh, gold standard. Um, so this is in the side of the data and then uh, they, uh, or users uh, commonly say, well, what for? Okay, um, okay. Yeah, so, so the, this is the status, current status is being published, is, is available. We are reorganizing the pages. We are trying to add metadata to the pages so that it can be shown. Uh, and, and we are uh, using these uh, ontologies uh, that we are, have identified. Uh, we want to, uh, we already respond with JSON and we will try to uh, implement JSON LD so that it can uh, contain semantic information as well. Um, we have enabled part of the API used for extracting publications and uh, feeding them to the WordPress, uh, WordPress site of the Catalysis Hub. So that's that's what's going on with the current progress. And we we also want to produce examples that show how this data can be used, reused, and uh, the, and and we can. Uh, that this way accelerate discovery and accelerate uh, um, pro the, the production of new results. So th th for that, we are working to develop the catalysis research workbench. And one of the first things that we started doing is to develop a workflow demonstrator. So this workflow demonstrator uh, uh, is uh, based on uh, an XAS, uh, uh, X-ray absor absorption sp spectroscopy example. We started with manual examples with Demeter and large. Then we scripted these examples and the final st stage, we try to automate everything with uh, next flow on a, uh, uh, on a um, HPC uh, cluster. So, and this has been documented in a paper which has been accepted. So that's a, a really nice result. And we are also looking to develop new workflows for Quens and PDF, which, which has a new back proposal at the moment. So the first results, this is the, a very simple workflow. Get the raw Nexus data, uh, extract the, te the uh, individual text files, process these text files with Athena and produce an Athena project. In, in this Athena project, the data is normalized and, 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 and filtered, and then uh, do a fitting with, with some crystallography data, which is, is provided uh, also. And we can then compare how we have improved the situation from uh, Manual workflow operated by a novice uh, like myself. I, I didn't know anything about the uh, XAS processing or analysis at the start. Uh, I calculate to analyze all these 3,790 uh, 3, groups in a Nexus data would take me 20, 60, 63 days, 26 days to, for an expert such as uh, Donat or Xiaojun. And then when I scripted this, uh, well, it gave me really good results. So 23 hours with the meter, 103 hours with large. And then when we take these and uh, these scripts and, uh, and we adapt them for a workflow, we can even speed that further with the 
to to get, getting it down to about seven hours. So that's that's a quite a nice uh, result. Uh, something we can show for. And again, we say okay, we have a target audience, and we said uh, advanced users can come and build new workflows and try to do new things. Intermediate users can uh, maybe modify these workflows and use them in their own research. And the new uh, users, new, new newcomers can just get a very nice uh, interface where they can just learn and execute these workflows uh, if they want uh, repeatedly. Uh, on the activities, well, uh, we have been developing this, uh, uh, listening to the community, engaging uh, in different uh, uh, forums, uh, including the UK Catalysis Conference, the RDA conf uh, plenaries, uh, the project or internal project meetings and seminars, and we also sponsored uh, training events like the Catalysis Data Management Workshop in, in June. Apart from that, we try to publish everything. So we have a GitHub group for the Catalysis Hub. This is the address if you want to see what we have published. So far, it's only the interface and the workflows, but we everything we are developing will be eventually published there. Uh, so, well, I think I, I did it just in time. Uh, thanks to my colleagues and, uh, uh, and, uh, and at the Catalysis Hub and the, at the STFC and, and to the people at Supercomputing Wales for providing with computing resources. And that's all. Okay. Thank you, Abraham. And it's, it's good to see the progress that's being made. And it's, it's, it's good to see some examples that remind us of how many things are really involved in doing science and like the work that require these workflows and all the steps that are involved as well. It's easy to somehow think, oh, it's just so simple, stick it all in a standard data file and you know everything will just magically happen. So thank you. Um, if there's any very quick questions, Brian, if you'd like to start sharing your slides and we'll see if anyone can get a question in before Brian starts talking. <laughs> I hope that started showing my slides. It says it has it started. Coming I don't in. see the slides. <laughs> Thinking about it. Thinking about yeah. it. Yes. I'm getting a word. Yes, here we go. It's, I think it should be there now. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. Um, off you go. OK, so yes, I'm going to talk about um, a new program. It's very interesting coming after uh, Christoph, because I think that what, the, what Christoph is, is doing in Germany um, sort of is further down the line for us and very much an inspiration for what we're trying to do. So this is sort of talking about a, a new program uh, that we are trying to establish in the UK. So this is actually still quite early days. So this is all quite quite high level, but I hope it gives an indication of, of our direction of travel. So, so I'm Brian Matthews. I'm, I'm from the Scientific Computing Department of, of STFC um, so, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, where we operate large-scale facilities and other services on behalf of, um, of physical science and other communities. Uh, and this is an initiative with my, my colleagues, uh, Brian Baker Reggie and Barbara Montanari and, and, and uh, Basti Budakoff, and also in uh, collaboration with, with colleagues in, in Southampton, Simon Coles, Jeremy Frey, and Nicola Knight. And, and, but we are kind of just uh, heading this up, leading on this. There's a large number of other people that were also in, engaged in this whole process. So to give a, you know, to, to, to motivate what we're trying to do, you know, we're looking at the, the whole physical science research ecosystem, which is large and complicated. Uh, we kind of divide, di divided it sort of arbitrarily into sort of four main areas. We have, we have big national facilities and institutes and hubs like um, neutron and synchrotron sources, FALs, but also cross-institutional initiatives. Um, or, you know, bringing together different, uh, like the Catalysis Hub, which brings together a number of institutions into a sort of common research focus. There are laboratory scale research facilities, smaller research facilities, provide, providing uh, particular uh, specialist techniques and instruments, but, but supporting a, a wider academic community. There's a lot of 
um, codes and community projects um, for sort of long running um, uh, uh, codes, simulation codes, analysis codes provided by computational science. And then there's the sorts of research institutions, groups and laboratories um, as the sorts of things that Christoph was talking about. Um, uh, you know, the, the researcher going on the lab working on their in, the, in their own local resources. And this is backed up with, with sort of data resources and collections, which may be open licensed, uh, opened or licensed uh, commercial services, or um, provided by journals or provided to repositories. So a lot of a wide number of very scattered data resources. And then it may be backed up by um, uh, computational resources, either very large scale tier one or tier zero, uh, or, or more local or regional. Uh, or more specialist sort of machine learning type resources. So very complicated infrastructure um, that, we, that we have in uh, support of physical science, um, all generating data at enormous rates, very diverse and quite fragmented. So we got to, so um, uh, whilst there's an awful lot going on, it's not particularly well connected in many ways. So the challenge here is for us is, um, you know, data is our real driver for research in physical science. So this leads us to a lot of, you know, this is the sort of problems that, we, that are occurring, uh, you know, managing, just managing and storing that large amount of data generated instruments and then making that data accessible and reusable it is just a major challenge. Uh, and then all these different sources, how we then integrate that data together from, from experiment simulation theory, building uh, rich workflows to combine data from all those different sort of, um, and analyze data from all those different sources, uh, explore, explore that mass accumulation of data uh, by data analytics is uh, machine learning and data analytics is, uh, you know, then becomes an increasing problem. And then keeping that, sustaining that, maintaining that data resource available for the long term beyond the lifetime of particular projects or institutes um, uh, is also, you know, becomes a major challenge. So what we're proposing is we need a, a, a data infrastructure fit for purpose. Um, a coordinated over, overall existing infrastructure to help us uh, with these longer term challenges. And what we see is, is with PSDI is a sort of gap in the market for us. So we've seen that there are initiatives underway in many countries. I, I mentioned some here, you know, to, uh, the MGI and, and others going on in the US. NIMS are doing a lot of work in Japan, a lot of different European data infrastructures like these particular projects looking at different aspects. And we've already seen from Christoph what the German National um, Research Data Infrastructure are doing. Uh, and they're, they're well ahead of us on this. In the UK, well, other areas have these sorts of data infrastructures. Life science is well, uh, quite well catered for in you know, with the um, Euro European Bioinformatics Institute and other resources. Um, in the environmental sciences, the National Environmental Research Council has quite an extensive program of data centers and, and computational resources. Um, physical science, by many main sort of chemistry materials related disciplines, not so much. Uh, still quite fragmented and, 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 and you know, a lot of really good investment, but all quite scattered. So what we're proposing is that we have a, a more coordinated approach and a, as, as a UK physical science data infrastructure. So that would, so the objectives this would be um, to connect all those things together provide more support for data collection, sharing, aggregation, interaction, and curation, and, and that platform, uh, integrated platform for that simulation data analysis for the physical sciences. So it can become a more digitally driven and uh, enabled research discipline, not replacing existing data infrastructures, but combining, enhancing them, and hopefully providing a more sustainable route. So we've been doing a lot of community engagement. Uh, so this is sort of that those four pillars, which we've which I uh, mentioned earlier, sort of instantiated the particular initiatives that are going on in the United Kingdom, and a large number of them in all these different spaces. So we're we're engaging with many or most of these, and we're sort of developing a plan on those around those four pillars to build a a, a, a digital research infrastructure for that for the physical sciences, and and these are the sorts of things on the right that we would be looking at going to do, um, you know, providing access to what reference quality data, um, allowing more sharing and, and accessibility and reuse, uh, allowing the combination across the data research lifecycle, um, supporting computation and, uh, and uh, machine learning, 
uh, and also uh, looking at the standards environment as a common data framework uh, to support open science. So where have we got to? Well, ourselves, the uh, UKRI, uh, STFC and, and University of Hampton put together a statement of need back in February. Uh, so demonstrating a community need and support for such an initiative. It's been quite well received um, by the EPS EPSRC, which is our fund the funding uh, body in that area. Uh, they came back to us and said, can you put together a, a short, um, broad scoping study over the rest of this year? Uh, which we said, um, yes, okay, um, in a very short time scale um, with, with a fairly substantial amount of funding in a very short um, time scale, we are, we've been trying to put together a, a scoping study to consult with the community on the scope of the requirement for PSTI. And this has to be completed by March. So it is a very short, but actually quite a broad uh, scoping study. And the idea here is that we would do a consultation, look at the scope and requirements for this social infrastructure and develop a roadmap for future investment into such an infrastructure. So, the, so to quickly go through what we're doing in this pilot, there are basically four uh, themes, a stakeholder engagement theme, uh, a, a large program of discussion with people, looking at the events to look at the requirements we have. Uh, that will be backed up by a number of particular case studies in, in, with particular partners just short, um, uh, detailed studies of, of existing frameworks. Um, we won't be able to invest very much in new work, but, but um, uh, you know, studies on, on what they're doing, you know, the scenarios out to demonstrate how they could influence, uh, and such an infrastructure could influence the research going on. Uh, a study on the architecture and technology we might use to build such an infrastructure. And then finally, uh, looking at how we, what, government structures, how it might be structured in the future, in the, in the future roadmap. Um, I've got a couple of slides on, on the sort of case studies we're doing. There are, there are eight case studies in this. Uh, the first one involves uh, Abraham, uh, so we're working with the Catalysis Hub. So it's already been covered already, but then uh, I won't go through these in through detail. In detail, The rest are looking at different aspects of um, uh, both the physical science domain, uh, and also the different types of computational scenarios and techniques or, 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 uh, or data scenarios and techniques we'll be looking at. So like looking at um, text mining, looking at uh, materials discovery, looking at data storage. Um, and this is sort of the second one, looking at the use of electronic notebook, looking at, um, um, uh, um, looking at uh, data trust and sharing. So um, a number of different case studies. So, Hopefully, by the time we get to the next RDA, we'll have, we'll, we'll have something more to report on these. Uh, that's more or less it. I had a slide on um, what we might do with the um, chemistry research, um, research data interest group, uh, but I think we can hold, hold it up back to later. So I think I'll, I'll finish there. So thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you. And it's good to see that plan being laid out. Um, Gerhard, you're next, because I don't think Kirsten is here. Um, so Gerhard, while you share your slides, if there's any quick questions for Brian. Well, do, can I have, ask a question? Yes, well, go for it. Uh, yeah. As long as you can uh, multitask. I, multitask. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's maybe a pretty UK-centric question, but, uh, but there's also a, <clears throat> now initiative uh, by the Royce Institute of Materials for a data yep. infrastructure. Yep. Uh, it, how, how are the two connected or are the two connected? We, um, the Royce are one of our, our, our major people. We are groups we are we're consulting with. Um, you know, we, we're looking at their needs. They have quite extensive needs. Um, so we are coordinating with them and, and we would expect that we would um, work with them um, uh, as part of this. So they would, they would be, uh, they would at some point would, would be part of, this as we go forward and we certainly one of the the case studies involves part of the the, the um, Royce Institute um, so um, yeah so we're, we're coordinating with them very good okay um, Gerhard is next um, we had a question earlier about ontologies and chemistry if anyone's going to know where there's activity here I reckon it's Gerhard but it's going to talk to us about ontocoms and I assume you see the the Let's right the slide, screen yeah. with, with the actual slide on it. Yes. <laughs> okay, <thank you. laughs> okay, so here we go. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm speaking here. So I'm, I'm based in Cambridge. Um, um, 
own a small consulting company here, but really a, web, uh, a partner in the uh, Onto Commons project and other European initiatives in the area of, um, of ontologies and uh, data documentation based on ontologies. And so uh, onto, what is Onto Commons? Um, Onto Commons is a coordination support action. So, <clears throat> so it's not really a development project. It's a kind of a network project. I uh, started um, November last year and is, is lasting for three months, uh, 30, uh, three years, 36 months with 19 partners coordinated by um, kind of two organizations, um, TU, uh, TU Wien and Init in France. Uh, and uh, the background of it is, is the area what's called industry common. So it's really uh, how do we um, manage more shareable, reusable knowledge to, um, uh, you know, have get, extract more value from uh, from data that is produced in projects. So many EU projects are funded producing data, but um, maybe they don't exploit them. Maybe someone else can make use of them. So this is uh, then done by semantic data and semantic data standards. And you know, uh, and, and really what I'm what I'm talking about is ontologies. Uh, so this is a project about data documentation based on ontologies. Um, and you know obviously we, we've seen the whole landscape in the in the other talk. So ontologies is just one one piece of it and one one question to be discussed is really uh, are they always underlying all of these frameworks that we were hearing? Uh, where, where can they fit in? Uh, how do they how are they best used and so on? Uh, and and the, the, the sort of overall outline of it is that we're looking at um, uh, this pyramid that, that, that says that, uh, you know, okay, we're working at application levels, but uh, maybe across um, <clears throat> a domain like chemistry or within chemistry, certain domains, we can agree on, uh, you know, on a common representation. Uh, and then if we go to even higher levels, we can agree on on very broad terms. And then there is a top level that kind of describes everything under the sun or in the universe. So very fundamental categories, so-called so top level ontologies. Um, and if we can build a system whereby this is much more coordinated uh, than it has been in the past, then we can actually derive some impact from that. And we can look at this in demonstrator cases. And uh, we uh, focus in this project on what is called materials and manufacturing, or in EU terms, it was the NNBP program, which is really anything from, from chemistry uh, to, uh, to, to processes and manufacturing plants and so on. Uh, uh, and, and also we're looking at um, basically a set of um, recommendations for how to use ontologies as well. Uh, there is a bit of a, a complex thing uh, given that you know we have um, in this pyramid uh, you know multiple descriptions within each layer uh, so there, there could be issues uh, saying okay well you know I, I'm, I'm describing you know chemistry in this way and you know someone else is doing it another way so how can we how can we align that and there are obviously many examples for that and then uh, even at the top level, people disagree, right? Uh, and, and so this, uh, this is the, the issue that, uh, you know, okay, ontologies could be a good idea, but we can fall into the same trap even there. Uh, so we have, um, we are working mainly with three so, uh, so top level ontologies, which is uh, uh, BFO, Dolce and Emo. Uh, there, there are more. Uh, but these are the most widely used in our domain. Uh, and, and we're looking at how um, you know, some interoperability between those and Lyman can be found and also how you and then best work with them. Um, this is done by obviously a very, very interdisciplinary approach. You know, you need to have uh, the domain experts, first of all. And, and you know, I, I guess that the key message here today is that um, domain experts need to get together to lay the foundations for that in vocabularies, in dictionaries, in agreeing on terms, because without that, you know, we, we, we don't get out of the starting blocks. I mean, we can have any top level in the world, but uh, how do we use them? Well, we need to have an agreement at the domain level. When we have that, then we can work with ontologies, with implementers, with, et cetera, et cetera, with the whole value chain to do something meaningful. Um, the, the project is organized in, Kind of focus areas along those lines. So domain ontologies, top reference, uh, where you know all the ontologies can sort of um, you know um, fight over over high level terms, and uh, and then you know obviously also uh, very um, industrially based applications, also academic applications reaching from 
um, <clears throat> tribologies uh, to kind of um, ma maintenance, industrial maintenance and so on. Uh, yeah, domain ontology. So, so we have this sort of cloud of domain ontologies. And actually, when, when you look at it, even the things that, that we have done, we've, we've done some public uh, or will be published uh, survey on domain ontologies, it's actually very little. I mean, there are things that are kind of, we kind of call domain ontologies for, for lack of actually having some, um, but, uh, but a lot of even what is called domain ontologies are really very application focused. Um, and, and so we, we, we need to, you know, um, do that and, and, you know, what this is a community that actually has something, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of light years ahead of many other, other fields by at least having the gold book and, 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 SIF and, and, and so on. There is international vocabulary of metrology and there is a need also even to, to have repositories of any, any resources in the field that, that can actually um, claim to be domain ontologies because it's quite hard even to find them. Uh, so the same as finding data is also finding these types of resources and, and so on is actually very difficult. Um, and, and so hopefully the project can contribute to that by you know, having this sort of on, onto commons uh, ecosystem uh, of um, you know, uh, ontologies and specifications and, 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 and resources and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, this is all really um, I want to say um, without going into any specific examples. Um, join the, the effort, you can also register there uh, to be involved and in, because we're running a number of workshops and you know uh, demonstrators and activities to get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. I was failing to multi. Yeah, if you take it, if you take over, Stuart, that would be great. Any questions? I guess I would say thank you for mentioning the gold book there. Uh, <laughs> you know, in, in a sense, uh, it, it is a great resource already, but um, but it's uh, it's it needs to be a lot more, and that's what we're going to talk about right here uh, in yeah. these slides. So. So I'm going to give a quick update of what's going on in um, IUPAC in, in this area. Um, this slide here kind of summarizes the whole talk um, and there'll be more information on here than you're gonna be able to ingest in the time that I talk about it. But we're gonna talk about identifying structures, the gold book, as we've mentioned, um, work that's going on to update some existing standards and make them more fair. One I'm not gonna say anything much about is um, Thermo ML. Um, but that does sort of point out that some of these activities that IUPAC are doing are in conjunction with other organizations, whether it be NIST, um, Pistoia Alliance, um, and, and, and various others. Um, so I'll push on with the meat of this, and we've been talking about the Gold Book, um, and Stuart here deserves a lot of credit for really taking this um, this resource, which is a sort of digital compendium of all the various terminologies that IUPAC has built up over the years and turning it into something which I think is pretty fair. Um, you can search it. Um, its terms have DOIs. There's an indication of provenance. Um, you know, it now has an API that you can reference as well. Um, and there's obviously, there's been talk going on about the appropriate licenses for something such as this to make sure that there is a clear license um, that enables people to reuse it, but also ensures that its integrity is retained. And the current focus of efforts around this now is making sure that updating of this is embedded into IUPAC's processes so that we don't have to sort of be you know, grabbing new terms and updating new terms from PDFs and documents and things like that. And that itself is an undertaking and Stuart can say more about that if need be. Um, how we describe chemical concepts is one thing, how we describe chemical structure is really important. And you know, the very beginning for IUPAC was standard names for things that everybody could agree we call um, uh, the same structure, the same thing. And then over the years, various sort of de facto ad hoc sort of standards have grown up that have enabled chem informatics and people to process uh, machine representations of structures. Um, and these can be very powerful, but they can also be very ambiguous um, and you don't necessarily have one string that describes structure. And this is where INCHI comes in to can provide a non-proprietary standard canonical unique identifier for a particular structure. Um, 
recently. Um, so the INCHI is essentially a joint effort that involves the INCHI Trust who have responsibility for the kind of development, maintenance and sustainability of the standard and IUPAC who provide the scientific oversight. Um, the INCHI Trust has recently appointed a technical director and a marketing and outreach director. And these have been to address some strategic aims. One is about making sure that the code base that drives INCHI is in a sustainable and maintainable form. Currently, the knowledge about this rests with those who developed it in the first place. And so we want to move to a more open development process that means that it's more likely to be preserved. Supporting the various project groups, which are shown at the bottom there, which are addressing um, various areas where INCHI you know, isn't sort of like up to the kind of achieving what it sets out to do, making sure that we support those, and then developing community engagement to sort of grow the community and hopefully ensure money comes in to sustain the activity going forward. Um, that's something very new for IUPAC actually is moving you know beyond chemistry and a little more into biology. Um, Helm is a hierarchical notation language that has been around for a number of years. It was developed in Pfizer. Um, and it aims to bridge that gap between small molecules where you've got you know, kind of reasonably well defined formats and sequences where there's a lot of sort of um, sequence based tools and sort of think about biomolecules and Helm provides a sort of um, graphical and a linear type notation that allows you really to do for biomolecules what you can do um, for small molecules with Inchi. And IUPAC have entered into a partnership with the Pistoia Alliance to work out the best way of sustaining this into the future. So it started in Pfizer, was developed through Pistoia, and now IUPAC are starting to get involved in that too. Um, there's been a project ongoing, which was sort of arguably prompted by the geochemistry community, who was saying we, that you know, they desperately wanted a machine accessible periodic table. Um, so there is a commission out there that spends a lot of time and a lot of effort coming up with the precise numbers that provide the atomic weights of um, elements and the like. Um, and it would be great to make a machine accessible version of this. And what we've discovered in approaching this project is, uh, you know, some of the challenges around how data such as this gets used, people respecting the precision and the uncertainties and things like that. So this project aims to make sure that uh, there are appropriate recommendations and algorithms and reporting of these um, and values in a way that can be reliably ingested by machines. Um, it's seeking people or communities interested in getting involved. If that might be you, then let us know. Um, Stuart uh, can talk about this one if you can, because you know yeah, a lot more about it. Absolutely. Um, so uh, the units of measure in chemistry is uh, kind of under the auspices of commission uh, I.1, which is uh, in the uh, physical chemistry division of IUPAC. And we uh, currently work off of the third edition of what's called the Green Book, which defines uh, ontologies, uh, sorry, ontologies, quantities and units for chemistry. Um, in, in the scope of that uh, document, there is an existing uh, third edition, and then the fourth edition is due to come out, uh, re coming up here in the next year. But we're already thinking ahead to the fifth edition, which is going to be digital first, with the idea that, that IUPAC really needs to think about supporting digital representation of units in addition to human representation of units. Um, and uh, to that uh, effort, uh, a number of us are involved in uh, different activities. Uh, Bob Hanish that's on this call, uh, heads up the, the Code Data Drum Task Group, Digital Representation of Units of Measure Task Group. Uh, and I'm on that too. And then uh, we also have, uh, both of us are also on the CIPM Task Group for the Digital SI Framework, which is an initiative that's being started through the CIPM to uh, to formally you know digitize the SI. Uh, so we're anticipating those as well. So there's a lot of interest in this particular area and a lot of activities ongoing, which we're trying to obviously um, um, coordinate uh, as best as possible to move this forward for chemistry. Thank you. Um, the next area to talk about is spectroscopy. Um, it's a project that started last year to um, come up with a standard for fair data management of spectroscopy. Um, the point this project has got to is to come up with some principles that I think you know we feel are quite important and probably broadly applicable. 
Um, there are loads of different formats in which Spectra is found and some are um, public, some are, some are open, some are proprietary, and, and I don't think we're necessarily going to get people to converge on one format, but what we can certainly aim to is make sure that people are reporting a standard set of metadata. So what we're aiming to do here is come up with a hierarchical metadata specification that's independent of any particular data representation, dispose the contents of a spectroscopic data collection, I think that's recognising that it's not just the sort of spectra file, it's, it's all the other sorts of files that might come of this, in particular the chemical structures and make sure that, 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 that we're connecting the structures to the data. And I think you recognize as well that there's different levels of data reporting that are relevant in, in, in different um, contexts as well. Um, so the concepts and principles of this are uh, going to be published in a special issue of Pure and Applied Chemistry that's coming up and our priority now is to engage with a range of representative stakeholders. We're obviously very keen to talk to NFDI for Chem and their ideas around minimal metadata, um, information profiles and the like to make sure that these projects are aligned. Right. Um, it's often said that chemists are not very good at sharing data and this chart from this um, article in 2015 might seem to suggest that it shows um, uh, articles in biology, chemistry, maths and physics and shows not very many articles share data from chemistry. But what it also shows is a chart is that there's an awful lot of articles that refer to original data. And I think chemists do actually publish a lot of data. Um, the challenge is that they're not necessarily doing it in ways that are um, readily adaptable to and accessible to machines and for reuse by others. And yeah, you know, IEPAT recognizes this um, as the, a challenge. I mean, the initiatives we talked about take us so far, but there are so many more aspects to chemistry than those that we've covered. Um, and yeah, I think Christoph showed a wonderful sort of you know, overview of what's needed in terms of the infrastructure and the standards that make it easy for chemists to publish the data that they have in ways that we might expect today. And IEPAT, itself doesn't have the funding to do all of this and so this concept of a center of excellence for digital chemistry standards has evolved as a sort of focal point for thinking about what are the resources that we need in order to sort of drive activity in this area and also coordinate across activities within chemistry and link out to initiatives in the wider sphere which I think probably takes us on nicely to the discussion that we want to have now about how this particular group within RDA might be able to help facilitate some of that. But I'll happily take any questions on anything covered there before we launch into that. Uh, I, I might Ian throw out just quickly the as a follow-up to the, the points about the, the, the gold book, um, that you know, we are currently aggregating these concepts into the gold book to expand the content of it, but there is a, an intent to you know, move, to the, move to the point of developing that out into an ontology. Uh, but uh, as everybody possibly knows, uh, IUPAC is a volunteer organization, and so this uh, will only happen uh, as we can find appropriate resources to do so. so uh, we're working on it, but uh, you know we're trying to we're trying to play catch up. I think in some fashion with this. Thanks, Christoph. I saw you pop onto screen, and I know you said you had some comments on on uh, kind of the questions that we posed. Yeah, I guess quite quite trivial ones actually. Um, I, I've been. Uh, in, also involved in ontology and vocabulary development uh, during my time in Cambridge at the EBI. Um, and and I, I sometimes felt it was a little bit of a futile endeavor um, because we invented vocabularies and ontologies without often really having the proper applications for them. It, it seemed like a purpose in itself. Um, and I, I think this chicken and egg problem is slowly get, going away uh, with initiatives like NFDI for Chem, but, but also, of course, repositories being developed elsewhere. And I think this would be the best um, driver for activities in this group here also and in, in the IOPEC, having a concrete problem uh, that researchers have in de depositing data 
and then deciding to create a work group or you know where very often the working groups will already be existing and and actually there is now funding for getting people together to develop these um, standards ontologies etc so i i think being more driven by needs and and applications will definitely help this group to do more meaningful work Do you think that NFDI for Chem is going to be generating some of those needs and applications? And you know, obviously, you you have your you know you have your resources for driving things forward. And is is this potentially a place where you might want to come and connect with the wider community too? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we, we are developing some uh, of the domain, some some of the very specialized repositories, such as an NMR repository, which links very nicely to the uh, spectroscopy. Um, efforts in IUPEC that you've been just um, presenting and uh, we already I mean we, we already spoke and we know that there's a lot of synergy there um, but also the domain specific uh, the yeah the domain specific but very generic repositories such as chemotion radar for chem and and the things that are going to come up here will also have very concrete needs for as I said, minimum information standards, and those could be beautifully uh, developed under the, the auspice of um, both, both this RDA group as well as the IUPAC. Okay. Uh, Brian, did you say you had some thoughts? I can't remember. Yes, I, I, I had a few. Um, I, I kind of recognize the kind of the question here. I mean, I, I, some of you might know I've been involved with the uh, sort of other interest group, sort of domain interest group around pho um, photon or neutron science, um, facilities science. Um, and the question of how to get, how to work in such an interest group, domain interest group to, 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 to engage and um, work across the whole RDA it, it tends to be a, a question that comes up there as well um, so it is isn't something that's um, unique to chemistry I don't think um, uh, but yeah so in our PSDI um, you know we would see that um, engagement with standards I think I did in one of my slides so engagement with standards bodies is a it would be a core function it would be a core function of what we would do um, and including the RDA, um, as well as other bodies which we've already seen. Uh, and we would see that um, this group and indeed the materials interest group as a sort of an entry point, a way of consulting uh, and engaging with the community in those areas um, to get broader feedback. Um, but then I think there's a question about how you then work with the rest of the RDA and what we should be doing is encouraging people in our groups to join all those other groups all those other working groups that are um, doing all the, the other work of the RDA in generating recommendations um, both and I see that as both requiring re doing the requirements from this community from the chemistry into those groups. But I think there's an important way that important aspect that's also somewhat forgotten, which is interpreting what those groups say back into the, the community. I mean, um, something that I'm, I'm involved with at the moment, again, in the photon and neutron community is uh, in a European project around fair data standards, sort of how, applying fair data. So we take something like the um, RDA fair maturity model and other work around fair maturity. I think, well, how, how does that really apply to um, photon neutron science? Um, taking uh, there's work on um, data management planning in RDA, how does that really apply to photon neutron science? And it's, it's not actually, well, you just take what they've done and, and, and apply it into our communities and apply it into our institutes 
there's a lot of interpretation, um, a lot of relating to the specific domain standards that's going on in those areas, the domain ontologies, the, and the, the vocabularies and such, and, and the practices that goes on in that community. Um, so uh, interpreting how, how um, uh, could be a, could be a key function of how such a group like this works. Um, I and I did actually pick up some particular um, examples of other groups that we that are doing interesting things. I think we should engaging persistent identifiers. There's lots of persistent identifier work. Um, I'd, I'd highlight the samples one and the instruments one uh, groups that are, that are happening elsewhere in RDA. Um, I mentioned the fair data maturity model um, and sort of discovery metadata. You know, the, the, um, this is something that comes up very much in European Open Science Cloud uh, of not being in isolation. Uh, we, we need to talk to be accessible to other disciplines. So um, uh, having that, those common metadata standards, those are the sorts of things that have, but, but we've got to also engage with the, you know, are you packing and IUCR and, and, and all the and other, and the other more domain specific standards bodies? Um, uh, uh, and so there's that borderline, deciding where that border sits, I think is quite a complicated question. Okay, thank you. Um, I see a comment from Bob Hanish. Is it useful to have separate interest groups for chemistry, materials, photons, neutrons, electrons, etc., or is some consolidation in order? And I guess, you know, you, Brian, you talked about a physical sciences infrastructure, um, whereas Christoph talks about a chemistry infrastructure. And I guess that's an interesting question as to whether we are better served thinking about physical sciences or focusing in on chemistry within an RDA context. So I was, I was looking at that and, uh, and in a sense, my thought from what Bob said is, um, while we have domain specific uh, interest groups, maybe there is a need for an, um, I guess how you would describe it exactly, it would be a, um, a, an interest group that might support uh, translating you know, RDA recommendations into you know, practical use cases in disciplines in a very general sense, you know, maybe, and then from the discipline side, uh, aggregating common uh, problems that are seen across all disciplines uh, to be able to kind of report those back to the RDA community so that there's, it's not, a lot of these issues maybe are not specific to sub-disciplines that there may be generic and can be approached in that way. Yeah, if I may, I, I would agree <clears throat> very much with, with that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's also from, from our, you know, knowledge and, and background and so on. It's extremely, I find it extremely difficult, you know, I'm not really from the data science field, but, um, you know, to understand all of the, the approaches and technologies and recommendations and so on. And it's, you know, we have uh, that, that make up in the end of a well-functioning um, infrastructure. So, you know, even on the ontology side, you know, we don't, Agree on what an ontology is. You know, we, you know, we 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 can have vocabularies, we have schemas, we have metadata metadata schemas, uh, and you know, for example, the question um, in in all of these systems, are we going? Are all of these systems going to use um, W three C um, sort of um, standards uh you know is there a always a kind of a triple straw involved and that's not as as just one of these sort of questions i mean you know you could build a data infrastructure without triple stores but you know maybe you want to build one with triple stores and this type of thing so there's without going too far into the architecture it's um um yeah it, it's it's quite confu it can be quite confusing uh to have different all these different recommendations you know how repositories work how vocabularies work how uh metadata metadata schema works and how, you know all, all of these things uh but you know how does it make you know how how how, how do how are these these components supposed to work together to um to make a powerful infrastructure 
Abraham, I know you sent some thoughts through in an email, which of course will capture any thoughts we received in an email as well, but anything you'd like to sort of, you know, particularly pinpoint in this discussion. Okay. So, yes, yes, uh, I, I think it's uh, the, 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 the thing that I like the most is, is, is being able to, to ex, uh, be exposed uh, to what other people is doing and how uh, I, I take uh, examples uh, and, 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 and the, the, the uh, notice of the uh, very, uh, work that's uh, been uh, performed elsewhere. Uh, if uh, I, 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 I think that also being able to present the things we are doing and getting some feedback is important. So, so this, this, uh, this, this as a forum for, for showing our ideas is, is very important. So that's, that's one of the things. And the other one is working like um, a guide to the, uh, as, as, as um, Christoph and, and Gerard were saying, guide us in, in, in how to use the recommendations or where to go if we want to, to try to, to look into uh, uh, implementing something. Uh, in the Catalysis Hub, we are very domain specific. Uh, so we are, we are a very, uh, all right audience may seem uh, small. However, we, I, I think we, we, we have interactions with a larger uh, part of the uh, chemistry um, um, ecosystem. So we look into different techniques for characterization, we look into the, and the, 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 and this, uh, the, the types of data that we are, uh, that with use within this uh, small subdomain, the types of data sets that we are, uh, that I've been looking at, they, they, they span uh, a very wide range of uh, alternatives. So it is, uh, neutron spectroscopy, X-ray spectroscopy, um, the data for, from, from laser imaging, the data from uh, 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 all these uh, different uh, characterization techniques. Uh, so, so it's um, in what, what, what the uh, researchers ask me is, okay, what is the ideal standard for publishing my spectroscopy data? Because you want me to publish my spectroscopy data, but uh, there is a, the, the, this spectroscopy data is in a range of formats from the uh, raw data in the Nexus file to the process data in this, um, Athena or, or Artemis project, which is the final output. So in this uh, wide uh, spectrum, what, what would be the ideal standard? Or, or, or is it okay to publish uh, uh, all the data and, and you, uh, uh, with uh, some provenance information so that you can say, at this point in the analysis, this is the important bit of data, or, or how, how can we guide that? So in a, a, and that's, that's the thing with, the, when, when you were talking about the de facto standards and things, for instance, I, 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 I would be inclined to say, oh, well, for me, the de facto standard for publishing a spectroscopy data is the, the, the standard for the tools that I use. So, so for me, uh, the standard that feeds uh, Athena, that's the most useful standard. It's text-based, it's uh, very simple, uh, lightweight uh, 
as opposed to, for instance, using Nexus as the standard, which is uh, requires more work. So that, that those are the things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's interesting because on the one hand, I think it's the sort of well, what was coming through this conversation is is that sort of macro level of how do you just interpret broad recommendations in a discipline to then okay the specifics within a discipline and the approaches that can be taken and i think that last point that you, you you've talked about i think what's come through with the first spec discussions is the importance of metadata re registration you know making sure that your metadata is well defined and searchable and discoverable um and yet there are then issues to do with how that data is subsequently represented but we don't need to solve all of the problems um all up front um i think just to acknowledge the comments in the chat about joint sessions so it's not just chemistry it's others coming together um to, to sort of you know avoid yeah, because Wed said the boundaries between these disciplines are soft and blurry. Um, the other thing I wanted to sort of acknowledge was a session I ended up in yesterday, which was domain specific implementation of RDA recommendations and community coordination. Um, I think the two main people driving that were Shelley Stall from um, the Earth Sciences Community and Dawei Lin from NIH. Um, and yeah, I think it was just a general, turned out to be a discussion about how different domains are approaching these challenges in a whole range of different ways and i think yeah, it's interesting to think what's the best way of using rda as a sort of um as, as part of all of that um obviously if there's co questions comments about anything that's been said what i wanted to do in the sort of final 10 or so minutes we got is perhaps think about who else we should be engaging to make CR dig more vibrant. Um, I don't know if this works, but yeah, you know, imagine Stuart and myself and Leah McEwen, who you know acknowledged her input into this as well, even though she couldn't be, weren't here. Who should be running the chemistry research data interest group? Where could we go for fresh blood? <laughs> Yeah, again, um, link, coming back to what I said in the beginning, I think uh, the, the best people to have on board is, is those who have an actual need uh, to manage chemistry data. Um, one of the things that I always worried about in the past was that we meet in these, you know, groups of RDM people who know what is needed and, and the, uh, the discussions goes in circles. and. And you know, we tell each other what we already know, but we need yeah. a concrete. We need a concrete need, um, a practical problem, and then start working on that, rather than staying on that relatively um, uh, um, in the cloud level of uh, talking about ontologies and what's needed and what different domains to do differently. That's all just this you know, turning in circles, um, get a concrete problem. Um, let's again, my, my example, um, I, I have a, a organic chemistry paper and want to deposit the, um, the data therein. That's a com complex com conglomerate. And I could imagine a very nice workshop of a couple of days sitting together, trying to with a concrete example, one paper, trying to find out what is needed and what is missing to deposit this paper, the data for this paper in the motion or whatever repository we decide to use as an example case. Similar to, I think Abraham's saying there with his sort of like outputs, it's how do I publish these in the most appropriate way? Yes, yeah, yeah, for instance, it's, it's when, uh, that's why we started with the demonstrator for workflows, like saying, okay, we have this problem of uh, processing large quantities of data. How can we help the researcher to speed up this process so that he, he can move on to different, more interesting things? And for instance, uh, our uh, current uh, status is like saying, okay, now if I want to move to Quens, uh neutron scattering data uh can i find the paper that has enough data and enough information so that i can replicate maybe or produce a workflow that uh, uh, validates these results something uh, which could be useful in the first instance just to learn the technique the technique for analysis 
but for their own, uh, can I apply this to other data sets? Then look for different data sets and see if that if this um, scales up or if this is applicable elsewhere. Uh, Ian, I'd like to, to, to point to the, uh, co the comment that Wanda just made in the chat. Uh, as a curator of chemistry data sets, I would like to know more of what folks who are looking for when they reuse those data sets um, and um, potentially help me curate a, for a more enhanced fairness. And I think that that's a really interesting comment because one of the things I've been thinking about is, um, in a sense, we're very focused, obviously, in the in the digital side of how we think about translating chemistry data. But there, I think there's still a gap, which is the bench chemist and what do they think about when they think about their data? And do they actually understand that, that they are thinking about a lot of data that is associated with the research data they're gathering, but they're not thinking about it in the sense of it being metadata. They're just thinking about it. Uh, it's just stuff that they collect or that they already put in their lab notebook in a very general sense. They, it's part of their process. We've got to, got to pull that out and you know, kind of try and get that perspective from them as the bench chemist and get it into, translate it for them into the digital arena. Um, and maybe that's a more of an education problem than it is a formally a, an RDA type of topic, but I think that's a big, a big piece that I see is missing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, the education and training is a strand of what goes discussions that go on at RDA as well. So, you know, there's possibly ways of tapping into those in a general sense, sharing from other communities and stuff. Christoph, you put your hand up and then you put it down, which I can't. <laughs> Did you think you had something useful to say and then decided nah? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That That's how it was. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I say it anyway. So I, I think a lot of um, a lot of the uh, the answer to Wanda's questions is in already in the in the publications that we create these days. Uh, I mean, they have evolved uh, so that uh, so that they could be useful to, uh, for others. If I describe an organic reaction again uh, in in Journal of Organic Chemistry, then uh, that that follows a particular um, convention that usually enables others to repeat the reaction um, so a lot a lot of this is already there and then in addition to this of course we are missing a lot of opportunities like um, you know electronically sharing all the nice spectroscopic data that we destroy in the same uh, uh, um, method section in the same paper so um, it's a mix of things uh, uh, when I talk, when I talked about minimum information standards earlier, I meant exactly this: that we need to get the organic chemists or, or whatever domain we are talking about into one room and decide about um, what we want to um, publish as minimum information. That, of course, contains what is already in the method section of our current papers in in an electronic form, but then much more, much more than that. And that links also to what um, to the comment that Robert has made uh, on the uh, professional societies and scholarly publishers. That's ex exactly the way to go. And we just last week, in fact, had a um, an NFDI for Chem workshop uh, called Editors for Chem, where we invited chemistry editors from all the major um, um, science publishers, scholarly publishers. To talk about exactly this problem, how we how can we convince authors, um, giving giving them the right tools, of course, uh, to actually deposit data, and the scholarly publishers play an important role in this uh, whole game, because we all know it's we are we are driven by publications, and only if the publishers, I wouldn't say force us, but strongly encourage to deposit data in the right way, only then this will happen. Um, he knows that it works very well in crystallography, it works uh, not very well in most other areas of chemistry. So on that point, I will acknowledge that Angie Hunter is here from the American Chemical Society. I don't know if there are other people from other publishers here, but it's good to have that eng engagement along. And you know, I think my early experiences of RDA was a great coming together of 
publishers and other people, other involved in other things. I don't know to what extent the publishers are engaging as much. Maybe it's harder to tell because we don't get to see people in person, but it's important that we, I think, preserve that because that is something that I think RDA has uniquely provided. Um, it's our time is up. Um, that doesn't mean to say we can't stick around and continue discussions, but I guess so people don't feel obliged to hang around. Um, we should probably draw proceedings to a close. I would like to thank all those who contributed to, um, to their, their, their presentations and all those who contributed to the discussion. Um, Stuart, anything final you want to say? Uh, no, just I could echo those comments and, uh, and thank you, Ian, for, for driving the discussion today. It's much appreciated. Okay. All right. We're in the after party we will, now, right? So <laughs> we will formally end, but yeah, <laughs> so feel free. We should stop recording, shouldn't we? Uh, yeah, we I don't should. know.